Good morning, church. I asked if I was going to be introduced this morning, and Pastor Julie said, no, they know you. <laughs> so, those of you who don't know me, I'm Dave Shrout. I'm your district pastor. I've served in this role for over 14 years. I'm the third longest serving district pastor in our movement. There are only two who have had this position longer than I have. Dave Wynn in Southern California and uh, Larry Taylor in Colorado. And so I don't know if that says that I'm smart or just determined <coughs> or good. I don't know what it says. <laughs> Isn't this gorgeous weather? Yes. Oh, man. And aren't you glad we don't live in Boston? Yeah. Oh, man. I have friends on Facebook, and I saw yesterday one of them had their, they, had, they spent two hours digging their two-car garage out, and so they could get out, and he said, the first thing I'm going to do is buy a snowblower for next year. I mean, I, yeah, I would have a snowblower if I lived back east, and that, they, uh, it's almost, I, I just don't tell them how nice it is. <laughs> I don't want to rub it in. Um, today is, uh, for, the, for the Church of God movement, today is Freedom Sunday. Freedom Sunday is an effort that our national office is asking us to participate in. We are looking for a thousand churches to give a thousand dollars to help stop the sex trafficking trade in America, in Germany, and in India. We can't do it alone. There are lots of other church groups who are waking up to the fact that, that the sex trafficking trade is, there are more sex slaves today in the world than there's ever been in slavery. There are more slaves today than ever around the world. I, I wish I could give you a, 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 the reference to this, but I've been told that a young girl a week is stolen out of Portland and sold into sex slavery. Portland, I do know, and I probably could find this stat pretty easily, has more strip clubs per capita than any other city in America. We have just been kind of numb to the whole idea of this problem that plagues us. Did you read the sting operation at the Super Bowl weekend where over 600 people, men were arrested for trying to buy an hour with a girl? 600, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. The recent research says Thousands of young women are sent in around the Super Bowl weekend to be sold repeatedly, daily. It is an issue that we need to pray about. It is an issue that we need to ask God to stop. It is an issue that we need to be a part of. Um, if you want to know more about what goes on with the Church of God movement, their, their, their website is full of information. It's called um, JesusIsTheSubject.org. You can like the Church of God, make sure it's the right one on Facebook. There are lots of them that, that want to be on Facebook. A lot of them try to, just a place to gripe. And that's not what, the, what social media is for. I hope you don't use social media to gripe. Um, the Bible tells us if we want to complain or gripe, we do it face-to-face, one-on-one first, right? That's how we do that. And we and the whole idea in Matthew 18, the whole idea is to win our brother or sister back, to become friends, and, and not to win our point. Um, but, but anyway, I hope that you will you will pray for this issue. I hope that you will support this issue in your own way that you can. Uh, once again, it's a it's good to be here. I brought my wife, the boss, the first lady with me today. And it's, it's always a delight to have her travel with me. If you want to know more about what's going on in Berlin, Berlin is a very interesting situation. Our mission group in Berlin, there's a coffee house called the Pink Door. And only ladies can go into it. If you're part of the Christian Women's Connection, they have a Bible study portion of it where they talk about it. But the Pink Door is a place where prostitutes, where women are sold into this slavery, can go and get a cup of coffee, and then there's a, another door that they can walk out. And there will be somebody there to meet them 
and to take them away from this issue, to, to really just sweep them away and transport them to another country and to another place and educate and train and equip them and get them out of that business. Tuesday night, during our summer celebration experience, two, one missionary who works there now and one who will work there once they're fully funded are going to talk to us about the pink door. So I hope that you'll be a part of our summer celebration experiences here. It's the last week in July. It's going to be a great time in the Lord. It has some great preachers who are going to come and share with us. Uh, today I want to talk to you about uh, being chosen last. Um, have, have you ever felt left out of a group? Anybody? I imagine all of us, at one time or another, have felt left out, have felt left by the curb, have felt just nobody cared about us. And, and whether that's true or not, or whether it's our imagination or not, we've all, I think, have been, felt like we've been chosen last. You know, I set my timer here, so I won't. That's what this is. This is a timer so I don't preach too long. And it goes off so I never know how long to preach. Um, I, I know I only look 24. I, I fully understand that. I'm, I'm confused. That's, people confuse my age all the time. But I was born in the 50s and I did go to elementary school in the 50s. And, and I remember what our teachers used to do in those days. They would pick two people. One, two. You guys would be our captains. And you would stand on different sides. And the rest of us would be up against the fence. And, remember this? And, and they would flip a point, or somebody would be the first one to be chosen. And, and they would, they, the captains would choose their team. And, there's, and up against the fence, there's always these people who are going, pick me, pick me, pick me. You're, maybe you were one of those guys. I don't like that you were. Um, they were always, always in the first, and, and the way the picking would always take place is the captains would pick their best friends first. Yep, yep. Right? Then the second group of people they, they would pick might be those with athletic ability who could really help you win whatever you wanted to win. But you really didn't want to be the last guy. You were the consolation prize. Okay, we'll take Joe. It's okay. <laughs> you remember those days? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they, they, it's so much now that they don't do that anymore in elementary school. It's go one, two, one, two, and whatever happens, happens. Uh, my, my sons, my grandsons, Isaac and EJ, play on the same basketball team, even though EJ is too young to play on that team. There was no one in his age group, and they let him play, and he's one of the best players anyway. But not that I'm bragging at all. But in that, that division, they don't keep score on the scoreboard. We went to see a game, and the scoreboard is up there, and, and, and EJ immediately shot and got a basket, and, and Connie goes, It's off the board! <laughs> Jess turns around and goes, It never will be. We don't keep score on the board. But everybody keeps score. Right? <laughs> Everyone kept score in their head. Well, we don't want to be last, and be picked last anymore, but I'm going to tell you about a guy who was picked last. If you have your Bibles, to open them up to 1 Samuel, the 16th chapter. This is a great story. I love it. Because it teaches us so many different things. It's a story of when Samuel anointed David to be king of Israel. It's a powerful story. So let me kind of set the stage for you. Because the very first line of this story, uh, 1 Samuel 16, 1, we have God talking to Samuel, and God is saying, Samuel, how long are you going to mourn for Saul? You see, what happened to Saul? Saul, Samuel anointed Saul to be king. And then there was a condition to that kingship. That condition was that you would always follow God's will, God's voice. In this particular case, Saul was Samuel. Uh, the, the word of the Lord came to Samuel. And Samuel went to Saul and said, "You were to attack the Amalekites. I can't pronounce it today." 
Because they were people who, when the children of Israel were going through the wilderness, did not let them go through their land. So they were to punish them. They were to kill every man, woman, and child. And kill all of their animals. It was the early, early uh, earth-scorched mentality. Um, on a bike ride, I had the south, I went through several cities that Sherman, General Sherman, in his march to the sea, went through. And that's exactly what he did. He destroyed everything. He burnt everything. He had a, about a four or five mile swath, and his whole idea was to break the will of the South. And he went through and destroyed everything. And to this day, there are remnants of those towns, and there are signs in those towns saying, sure, this town was destroyed by Sherman's March to the Sea. I probably saw that four or five times as I rode through those towns. They're still remembering that. They, God really wanted to punish these people as a way of demonstrating to the rest of the people around that the Israelites were God's chosen people and you don't mess with them. But Saul, he took his army, he beat them, he did everything right except when it came for the fatted calf, the best, best animals. Instead of destroying them, which what he was told to do, Instead of destroying them, he took them, the sheep and the cattle. And he took them under this guise that we are going to sacrifice these to God. We are going to, to have a big <coughs> worship service and we're going to kill these cattle in honor of God. But now Samuel says something very potent. He says, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice? as much as obeying the voice of the Lord. In other words, he was saying, God really wants us to listen to him and obey him far more than worship services, far more than going to church, singing in the choir, being on the boards. God wants us to listen to his voice and obey what he says far more than any other kind of form of worship. God wants us to listen to his voice. And so, the Lord told Samuel, go to Saul and say, I have say, I've rejected you. And he did. And he did that with, he was probably pretty scared. You don't normally go up to the king and say, God's taken his will off, his spirit off you, which had really happened. And so he no longer had the special anointing, the special blessing. And the scripture says Saul was tormented for the rest of his life until he died. And then Samuel is told to go to Bethlehem, to the house of Jesse. And there you will find the next king. And I'll tell you what to do. Samuel says, okay. Because the Lord says, take your, oil, your, your horn. And I look for my powder horn this morning to, to give you an illustration of what these horns look like. And my powder horn is made out of... Uh, uh, of a steers of cows and a horn. But this was, this could have been a ram's horn, it could have been one of the things that shofars are made out of where they play those. It, 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 was, it was a horn that held several, we would call ounces of oil. And it was plugged on both ends so he could fill it up. And this was his anointing horn. That he was going to anoint the next king of Israel. I fill your horn and take a heifer which is, it's a cow that's less than three years old. That's the definition. And so take this and go to Bethlehem and sacrifice. And Samuel said, okay, God, I'll do this, but uh, if, if word gets out to Saul, he's going to be pretty mad at me, and he's going to try to stop me. And the Lord said, all you need to do is say you're going to go and have church. Can't be, so to speak. You're going to go and have a worship service. And, and what they would do in those days is they would build altars, big 12 stones, and they would sacrifice the animal. They'd put the animal on there. They would burn the animal, but they would take part of it, and they would eat part of it as, as, a, as a celebration. Now, to put it in our terms, what they did is they had, they, they had church and a potluck, a barbecue. That's what they did. And they had roast steak. When is the last time you went to a church barbecue that barbecued steak? Huh? Man, I don't know that one. Um, that's what this, it was a worship service. It was 
a barbecue and they ate steak. Now that's church. And so that's what the Lord told Samuel to do, is you go to that town and say you're going to have a worship service and you're going to have a barbecue and serve steak. And so he did. Now he comes walking down the road, and I, I don't know about you, but I like to envision this thing. He's, he's pulling this cow, he's got his horn over here, and he's walking, and he probably has his, his people who he's discipling along with him, and they, pull, they go into the town of Bethlehem, and all the elders of the town of Bethlehem. Remember now, Bethlehem is not, uh, Jesus hasn't been born there yet, a thousand years before Jesus is born in Bethlehem. The central location of the of the uh, the government of Israel is not Jerusalem. <coughs> Jerusalem's a sleepy little town. It's going to be David, who later will be king, who will make Jerusalem his capital. But it's just a sleepy little town now. Nothing's going on there. Nothing big. In fact, Saul is up at Mount Carmel at this particular time, over on the coast where it's cool and the and the breeze from the Mediterranean comes in. And that's where he has set up camp. And so that's where the, that's where the, the, the seat of power is at this particular time. And so he's marching into Bethlehem. The elders come and say, have you come in peace? <laughs> See, prophets in those days weren't always welcomed. Because they would come and say, you're messing up. You're sinning. You've got to stop that. They didn't always like that news. In fact, we don't like preachers who tell us that we sin very much. Now there's, there are a few church people who don't think they've been in church unless their pastor has punched them right between the eyes. There, there, there's some who believe that, that that's good preaching. I think it's, it's a total range of good preaching is, is when you reveal the truth and let the Holy Spirit punch you in the nose. Right? So I hope today you get punched. Okay? So Samuel's response to the elders So that he said, let's have church. Now, I don't know where they had church. The Bible doesn't tell us if they went into somebody's home, if they had a big tent, or if he just went outside the city and set up this, this altar and, and burnt the, the and sacrificed to God and had this potluck and barbecue afterwards. But he did say, concentrate yourself. And Jesse, you and your family, concentrate yourself. And what that meant was that they would, they would actually take a bath. Growing up and a kid in the pastor's home, Saturday night was always bath night, right? How many of you grew up that same way? And when you went to church, and my mother saw me preaching like this, she would spank me verbally afterwards. I'm supposed to be wearing a coat and tie. And, and you know, things have changed. When I first started ministry, I wore a sport coat and tie to the office, and then on Sundays they wore a three-piece suit. That was standard. That's what everybody did. And Jerry, one of our pastors in Southern California, would come to the minister's meeting without a tie on. Oh, we thought he was radical. Now we thought that he, he was a prophet in the game. <laughs> they had their potluck, they had church, they consecrated themselves, they put on clean clothes, and they came and they worshipped. At the end of the worship service, Samuel was listening for the voice of the Lord. He, he's bringing Jesse and his sons over to meet with him. And the first son came. Now, I can't pronounce the guy's name. I really can't. Um, I have one pastor say, just pronounce it any way you want with authority and people will believe it. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not going to try to pull the wool over your eyes. The first son came up and he was, he was tall. He was strong. Probably had this huge big beard. I'm guessing. We don't know. But he looked manly. He looked like he could be the king. See, kings in those days... You know, our generals today, they plan the army and they sit in the safety of whatever place and they send everybody else out into the battlefield. In those days, they took the sword and they led the charge. They were first in line. They, they were the ones who, who were on the battlefield. 
And so you wanted somebody who was big and strong and powerful, who could win a battle, who could wield a sword, who could throw a javelin, who, who would be that, that person. This first guy looked the part. And it was, it, it, it's, it's a great comment. Um, when they arrived, Samuel saw El, Elabab, that's my best way of pronouncing it, and he thought, surely the anointed, the Lord's anointed stands before me. Now listen to the voice of the Lord as he speaks to Samuel, to Saul. Do not consider his height, his appearance, or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at things that people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. The heart. That's what God is in. How teachable are you? Are you a servant or a boss? The Lord looks at the heart. All of us judge people in our own way. Have you read the, the, the book Blink? Have you read the book Blink? It's a business kind of book. I've read it and, and I'm reminded as I look at it that, that we can look at some people and we can instantly kind of size them up and see what... And, and most of the time, it's, it's kind of intuition, it's kind of life experience, and it's, it's, it's our self-protection and, and our, the way we make friends. And in a blink of an eye, you can kind of figure somebody out. Now, sometimes you're right, sometimes you're wrong. But God has the ability to look deeper into our hearts and say part of us that we never let anybody else see and knows who we are. He rejected the first son. So in good Jewish tradition, you see the first son, when the inheritance was passed out, the firstborn male child is dedicated to the Lord, and he received two-thirds of the father's inheritance, whatever it might be. And the other third of the inheritance all went to the rest of the kids. So it was naturally natural that, that they would think that this firstborn son would be that person, the, the next king. But he was turned away. Can you imagine what he felt like? When he, when Samuel said, no, it's not you. Can you imagine the second born? He said, well, if it ain't him, it could be me. And he would, he stood right up and he went to, to be that person who, that, that, that Samuel was going to take that horn on and anoint him with oil and he's going to be the next king of Israel. And the Lord told Samuel, no, it ain't him. And the third son, well, if it ain't the first one, it ain't the second one, it could be me. And so he stood us up and he walks over there and, you know, it's not you either. Now, these three men, later on we're going to see them again. We're going to see them when David fights Goliath. They're going to watch Samuel anoint David as king. But they don't really believe it yet. You need the battle of David and Goliath and how these three olders, some older men were, were, were picking on David and pushing him down saying, you just, just come here to see the, the blood-borne guts. They really didn't get what was going to take place. All seven sons went before Samuel, and he rejected them all. And Samuel goes, oh, did I, did I miss what God was telling me? Did I miss, that I didn't hear it? Is it, is it the house of Jones, not Jesse? You know, did I miss up? And so he stood up and said, do you, do you have any more? And they say, well, we've got David. He's the youngest. The Hebrew word for youngest means insignificant. Hmm. Out of all of our, my boys, he's the most insignificant, insignificant one. In fact, he is so insignificant, we didn't even invite him to the potluck in the barbecue. We left him out of the field keeping watch over the flocks by night. He was a shepherd. So Samuel goes, Sent for him. And we're not going to sit down until he comes. Now think about that. Um, my high school basketball team, 
when they started to play, they could not sit down until one of our team players scored a basket. Then they could sit down and, and wait until their turn. Any of you go to high school when that took place? Anybody? It was, maybe it's just a California thing. I, I don't know. But that's what they did. They, they had to stand up until the first basket was made. Then they could sit down. Before that, they couldn't. They stood in amazement. They, they stood in honor of the next coming king. And those seven brothers must have looked at one another going, what on earth are they talking about? This guy is the most insignificant one. He is the smallest one, the rut of the litter. He is not very important at all. And they're calling for him. So, let's, let's leave the worship service and barbecue. And let's go to where David is. David wakes up in the morning. Catch this. David wakes up a peasant, and he'll go to sleep a king. Have you ever had a day that changed your life forever? Have you? Would you nod or shake your head? Uh, yeah. If you marry, that's the day I'm talking about. It changed your life forever. I've had a couple of those days. 1975, August 10th, I stood before my dad and my heavenly father, and I promised that I would be faithful to that woman till death to his part. And I kept that promise that whole time. Almost 40 years ago, that day changed my life. Another day that changed my life is when they put in my arms for the very first time this beautiful, the most beautiful baby girl in the world that was ever born. <laughs> That's what I referred to her before her birth and after her birth. And you know her as Laura placed her in my arms. And then, three years later, they placed my son in my arms, the, the one who's going to carry my name on. My son. The first child, I didn't care if it was a boy or a girl. The second one, I had a boy from conception on. <laughs> now, if he had turned out to be a she, he would never have known that I really wanted a boy. I made that very clear. But I wanted a son. And then seven years later, when they laid our youngest in my arms. I, I, could, I could say those days that changed my life forever. And every time I went to the hospital for another one of my grandchildren to be born, when, when, when Ryan, when, when Ezra was born, I was kind of sick and had a cold and I didn't want to get close to, my, to this new little baby. I didn't want to give her my germs. And, and, and then, so I'm sitting over on the side and Ryan gets up all by himself and goes to the basin at the crib there, picks up his son, his firstborn son, and he placed him in my arms for me to hold. My son gave me his son to hold. That is a moment I'll never forget. There are those days in our lives that change it forever. And in January, uh, July 29th, 2002, changed my life forever when I was struck by a car after riding 3,800 miles on my bicycle and I ended up the next 10, 11, 12 days in the hospital in intensive care, lost my spleen and all that kind of stuff. That changed my life. This is the day that changed David's life forever. He woke up, he did the normal things he, that a shepherd does when he wakes up in the morning. He wakes up, maybe he heard about the party that he wasn't invited to. He was left out. When they have this big worship service, and it'd be like if Billy Graham came to your town and everybody in your family was invited to go hear Billy Graham preach and have, have lunch with him afterwards, and you were left home watching the dog. <laughs> That's what it'd be like. And then, then you, you see the runner who's coming from the worship service and potluck and barbecue. He comes and he says, David, I want to see you. Can you imagine what must have gone through his mind? Uh, knowing me, I would have thought of what did I do wrong. But he went and he walks into the area of worship and we don't know if it's a house, a tent, or it's outside. But everybody is standing. And, and as he walks down the aisle, as he walks down to where Samuel is, he might have gone to Jesse, his dad, first, and he points him over to Samuel. And Samuel looks at him, and the voice of the Lord speaks to him. And he says, Arise, 
which means God had anointed him. And so what happens is, is he takes that horn out. And David comes forth, and, and I can imagine David would have knelt before Samuel, and he would have unstopped that horn of oil. Now, this morning, typically what we do in the Church of God, when you come, I don't know how, how Pastor Mike did it, but if you come and I anoint you, I'll, I'll put a little oil in my hands, and I'll make the sign of a cross on your, on your forehead, and that's how I anoint you. That's not how David got anointed. He poured all of that oil. Because it talks about in other places where it goes into your hair and runs down your beard and goes into your clothes. And you know you've been anointed. And everyone else around you knows that you've been anointed. And so he pours out that oil all over David. And he anoints him. And the scripture says, And the Spirit of the Lord entered him. David was chosen. David wasn't even invited to the party. He was the last guy on the fence. But he was called. Now, in our form of government, in 2016, we're going to vote. And then in January of 2017, there's going to be a new president who's going to take place, take office. And there's going to be a transfer of, of government. And it's going to be peaceful and it's going to be calm. Well, all depends on who if your guy gets in on. But there will not be war, there will not be battles with guns. There might be other kind of political whatever. But it's going to be a change of power. That's not what happened with David. David was anointed. And then Samuel went home. David went back watching sheep. See, I, I really view that calling, that, that anointing, as David's calling. I, I, I remember when God called me into the ministry, I was, I was between my junior, actually uh, my first time, between my sophomore and junior year in high school. And, and I, can, I can take you to the place that it's still standing. I can take you to the bench that I knelt at. And I can tell you everything that took place when God called me to be a preacher. And, and I didn't want to be a preacher because I stuttered and stammered so bad I couldn't even talk. I couldn't even order anything from, from McDonald's. And, and all through high school I had a ham sandwich. I had potato chips and a payday and Sprite. Not for three years. Not because that's, all I, that's what I wanted, but that's all I could say. But I stuttered so bad, I couldn't order anything else. It scared me. I think that was his calling. And in church, uh, I have heard many pastors of, before me have said, God has, has senior men and women in the church have gone to younger ones and said, Dan Harmon, who pastored the Fresno Church, traces his call to where my mom, after Dan got out of the Navy after World War II, and came, and, and mom saw something in him and said, I, 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 think, I think God's calling you to the ministry. Senior men and women, you, you can see in the lives of young men and women, you can see what God is doing, and you can, you can almost taste it in their own experience that God's calling them to, to preach, to teach, to be involved in full-time vocational ministry, but for whatever reason, my generation is silent. We're not doing that. And this, you are my generation. Time's up. <laughs> <laughs>
And your public committee is going to have a hard job finding the right person to come here. You need to really pray for them. Amen? Amen. So, Samuel went back to Ramah, and David went back to Sheba. In fact, we find that two other times David is anointed by the. It, it's kind of weird because Israel and Judah hadn't split up at that time yet. But the men of Israel and the men of Judah both anointed David as their king. And then he was able, after he had married Saul's daughter, and, and after he had been chased by Saul, and and uh, had the opportunity to, to kill Saul and, and had spears from Saul thrown at him a couple times. And, and he, he learned his job. He learned how to be king by leading his mighty men and warriors. And, and studying David's life, it, it's a study of leadership and, and how he made his life to make a difference. He had a cause to believe in. Because Samuel said, you're going to be the king. David then had to burn it wasn't given to him on a silver platter. He had to earn it. And so, my timer, I've got four more minutes. <laughs> so what do we learn from the story? We learn that it's not your skill set that God is looking for. It's not your degrees that you earn from college. It's not your charisma, your good looks, your big strength. It's not that at all that God looks at. God looks at this thing right here, the heart, where the Lord lives. Is it, is it a place where God wants to be? And where you are willing to follow the voice of God regardless of how silly it sounds. That's what God looks at. I think God is still calling people into to, to church leadership. It might take a while. But when God calls you, He will empower you and He will, he will help you. That little place over in Cambridge, California, where I accepted the call to ministry, and, and, and what I heard is, is, David, I want you to be my preacher. And my answer to God was this, Lord, please make me to the preacher you want me to be. That's a pretty wise prayer for a guy who's only 15 years old. God is continuing to do that to me to this day. And I thank Him for it. God is still calling you and I. And where He calls us, He will empower us. I want you to take a warning from Saul. Saul was called. Saul was successful. But Saul did not listen to the voice of God. And that spirit will be removed. Your opportunity to serve could be limited by how you live your life. Live it to the fullest. There's so many other lessons that we can learn from this. But I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to ask you to examine your heart and make sure your heart is the heart that God 